Hello and welcome to this video tutorial. Management is the glue that holds all of the other functions of business together. Finance, accounting, marketing, supply chain, etc. are sometimes disjointed and sometimes incompatible without a functioning manager. After some time, financial analysts, accountants, and marketing personnel get promoted and they become managers. The CEO of a big four accounting firm does not do double entry bookkeeping anymore. He or she is a manager of people and functions. Far too many managers are horrible at their job. It's not easy and it certainly has almost nothing to do with common sense as many novices tend to claim. It's hard and people need to be trained to be effective managers. Let's get started. Management is getting work done through the efforts of others that comprise two main tenets. The first is efficiency, which is getting work done with minimum of effort, expense, or waste. The second is effectiveness, which is accomplishing tasks that help fulfill organizational objectives, such as customer service and employee satisfaction. The objective is to do the job better than anyone ever thought and to do so with minimal waste and expense. That's a tall order. To do the job of a manager involves four very broad functions. They are planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. Marketing has their four P's. In management, we have POLC, planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. Most introductory courses in management are organized into subsections for each of these four managerial functions. We need to look at these functions more closely, so let's move on. As noted, managers plan, lead, organize, and control. Some of these functions can overlap and are best displayed in a one by three table with leading overlapping with the other three. Now, obviously, leading is people-oriented since it involves motivating employees and resolving conflicts. In fact, leading is about helping people do more than they ever thought possible. It involves helping people and getting things done. The goal of a good leader is to improve the subordinate's performance to levels that the subordinate never even thought possible. Leaders win wars, build massive international business conglomerates, and marshal communities together. Without leaders, all we have is a bunch of pencil pushing managers. All leaders are managers, but not all managers are leaders. If managing is hard, then leading is even harder. So as summarized in this table, the people side of management is also important to planning, organizing, and controlling. Planning involves getting department heads to work together to craft a plan. Planning involves setting tactical and strategic objectives from the most mundane of daily production goals to the complexity of entering new markets internationally. Some people live their life according to a plan. Everyone must have a plan, some plan, any plan. It's okay to change plans, but without a plan, you are forced to wander aimlessly while your competition takes your customers, steals your employees, and crushes your company into bankruptcy. That goes for people as individuals and people as managers. However, when managers fail to plan, other people pay the price. When an individual fails to plan, they sometimes just have to live in their mother's basement and play video games until they get soft and pudgy and while away their most productive years. But I digress. Organizing involves configuring the firm to be effectively dealing with powerful and not so powerful others to facilitate effective communication and to expeditiously get people and their skills where and when they are needed. Organizing is the arrangement of people, places, and things to maximize goal accomplishment. Some people are natural organizers and others are not. That's why there are thousands of management training programs that firms send potential managers to so that they can learn. Controlling may involve getting subordinates to control their behavior. Controlling also involves budgeting. 
Labor and raw materials are budgeted. Who makes those decisions? Managers do. Managers control everything from overtime allocation to staffing work schedules to balancing the mix of labor and materials on a conveyor belt. Management is not easy or everyone could do it. Think for a minute about a manager you had or have now. Are they good at their job? There's a good chance that somewhere in your past work history and certainly in your future work history, you will encounter a bad manager. Why is that? Do they just not try? Were they born with the wrong stuff? Could they be better if they were properly trained? Let's hope it's the latter. So send them a link to this lecture series and let's see if they improve. Let's move on. There are many types or levels of managers. Most organizations contain several types of managers. Executives are the managers at the top of an organization. For example, the CEO or chief executive officer or the president. Middle managers are beneath top managers and report to them. For example, they could be production managers or sales directors. First line managers are supervisors that make sure that day-to-day -day activities are carried out. For example, they could be a production supervisor or a field sales manager. If you are an entry-level employee, then your boss is probably a first-line manager. If a first-line manager is any good, then they may get promoted to middle management. If they are good at that level of management, they may become an executive. It is a hierarchy, and thankfully so. If it were not a hierarchy, then there would be chaos. Another type of manager is a team leader who motivates and encourages goal accomplishment of the entire team versus just individuals. And sometimes they act as a liaison to other teams and their team leaders. Many college students have class projects and inevitably the students on a project team elect or agree to let one of the members be the leader. Then that student team leader is the one communicating with the professor and they act as a sort of conduit of information. In the workplace, in restaurants, for example, food servers often have shift leaders. They tend to not have hiring and firing responsibilities, but they are sort of in charge of the others on their shift. While all managers plan, lead, organize, and control, differences exist between the management levels. Executives and middle managers have managers for their subordinates, but first line managers have non-managers as subordinates. Top managers spend more time planning and setting goals. Middle managers translate these goals into specific projects and first line managers direct and control those who work on the projects. Team leaders are responsible for facilitating team activities toward goal accomplishment. In restaurants, for example, there might be a special of the day that the shift leader educates the others on how they can describe it and sell it to customers. Our lives are surrounded by managers of all types. Maybe you're a manager already. Remember that managers do things and get others to do things too. So let's find out what they actually do. Let's move on. Dr. Henry Mintzberg found that managers play a number of people-oriented roles on the job. He elaborated upon these interrelated roles for managers, all of which, again, are people-oriented. He suggests that there are three main roles and several sub-roles for each. In the interpersonal role, managers serve as a figurehead, a leader, or a liaison, as they mostly interact with others in the workplace. They are often the point person, so to speak, on issues in the workplace. They help people get things done. They serve as intermediaries between work teams and between levels of management. All of these things involve interaction with people. Thus, these roles are interpersonal. In the informational role, managers provide information to key constituents. They monitor employees and processes so that they can develop reports, and inform others about employee performance. As a disseminator, they largely get the word out. They let others know about things in the workplace. For example, going back to the restaurant example, 
when the kitchen is out of trout or flander, flounder or whatever the fish special of the day is, it is a manager who informs the wait staff about it. They disseminate the information from the kitchen to the dining floor. Sometimes managers serve as spokespersons when dealing with customers, suppliers, employees, and local interest groups. For example, when someone is interviewed on TV about something big that happened in the workplace, the company will not let just anybody talk to the press. They send out a manager to act as a spokesperson in an informational role. Perhaps most important is the decisional role for managers. In the end, we are no more than the sum total of our decisions. That's true in life and in business. Managers need to make good decisions, and this is where management training can come in handy. As an entrepreneur, the first decision is whether or not to go forward with your idea or product. Many people think that their whiz-bang idea is a potential gold mine, but they lack the decision-making ability to see it to fruition. As they used to say in the Old West, sometimes you just have to pull the trigger. Managers are disturbance handlers too. Whenever some Karen walks into your business and wants a double espresso latte cappuccino with soy milk, coconut shavings mixed with Arabica beans, and you happen to be out of one of the 15 ingredients that she demands, it's the manager who has to deal with Karen. Good disturbance handlers are worth their weight in gold, especially if they can get Karen to apologize for the outburst. Of course, that's easier said than done. Managers make decisions in their role as a resource allocator. Let's go back to the restaurant example. If business is slow, the manager has to decide who gets off early and who stays for the duration of the shift. Labor costs money, and money is a resource. Managers make those decisions. Another management role is as a negotiator. The restaurant manager has to decide how much trout they should buy on a holiday weekend to meet the potential needs of the customers. The manager can negotiate the price and the amount. Because money is a resource, it is technically a scarce commodity, and managers have to negotiate the distribution of money. Let's move on. So you might be asking yourself if you have what it takes to be a manager. Most of what makes managers any good falls under the heading of skills. Skills are the acquired ability to perform something. We learn skills. We acquire skills. Effective skill acquisition enhances one's ability. Managers can be coached or trained to acquire certain skills. So what are the skills that are most important to managers? Technical skills are the ability to apply the specialized procedures, techniques, and knowledge required to get the job done. Technical skills are most important for lower level managers because these managers supervise the workers who produce the products or serve the customers. Team leaders and first line managers need technical knowledge and skills to train new employees and help employees solve work related problems. If a manager has no idea how to do the job that they're supervising, then they will not likely be effective. Accounting managers typically need to understand accounting. Sales managers typically need to be skilled as marketing. Technical skills become less important as managers rise through the managerial ranks, but they're still important. Look at the left set of bar graph. Human skills, the ability to work well with others, are equally important at all levels of management, from first line supervisors to CEOs, However, because lower level managers spend much of their time solving technical problems, upper level managers may spend more time dealing with people. But that does not mean that the skills are different. Conceptual skills are the ability to see the organization as a whole, how the different parts of the company affect each other, and how the company fits into or is affected by its external environment. Conceptual skill increases in importance as managers rise through the management hierarchy. Managers typically have a stronger motivation to manage than their subordinates. 
and managers at higher levels usually have stronger motivation to manage than managers at lower levels. Furthermore, managers with stronger motivation to manage are promoted faster, are rated by their employees as better managers, and they earn more money than managers with a weak motivation to manage. The truly interesting thing about this chart is that human skills are of high importance for all levels of manager. Management is human centric. You'll also note that technical skills become less and less important as the managerial level increases. Technical skills in this sense are not regarding the use of technology, but rather they are the skills necessary to perform the entry level job. As I noted on the introductory slide, the CEO of a big four accounting firm no longer does double entry bookkeeping. Bookkeeping encompasses the technical skills of accounting. A director of finance no longer calculates the present value of future cash flow. The calculation of such a thing encompasses the technical skills in the finance realm. In sum, as one rises up the management hierarchy, the need for technical skills goes down, while the need for conceptual skills and motivation to manage go up. And human skills are of vital importance for all levels of management. Let's move on. Personality is an important predictor of managerial success. In fact, personality plays a strong predictive role in all forms and all levels of job performance, not just for managers. Let's look at three very common personality tests. In the research on personality covering well over a century, we have determined that there are five major factors of personality. Sometimes this model is known as the five-factor model, or simply as the big five. A factor subsumes facets. So for example, the big five factor of conscientiousness entails the facets of industriousness, organized, diligent, persevering, etc. These facets are sub-traits of the overall trait of conscientiousness. So researchers went around the world and examined the lexicon, or the set of words in every language, and then wrote down every word that the culture used to describe personality. For example, in German, the word for friendly is frundlich. In Spanish, it's amigable. Every language has a word that it uses to describe the trait of friendliness. Therefore, the trait of friendliness is universal. After writing down over 4,000 trait descriptors, they factor analyze them in every language and the same five factors emerged. Thus, the big five are ubiquitous and can be used to organize a taxonomy of traits in all human cultures. An easy acronym to use for the big five is CANU. We'll see below why this acronym is important. There are dozens of free versions of the five-factor model available on the internet. The Cattell 16PF, which stands for 16 personality factors, is best used to predict vocational interest, which is an interest that a person has for certain jobs. Interestingly, the 16 personality factors have been further factor analyzed into the big five. This test is expensive, but it's very comprehensive and it helps people figure out what other people who have personalities like their own, what those people have chosen to do for a living. The key questions for those similar people are, are you good at your job and do you like it? This test is good for deciding who is promotable to top positions in a firm because such decisions are very expensive if they are not made correctly. Most people have heard of the Myers-Briggs type indicator or the MBTI, which is worthless junk that suffers from many psychometric problems. There's a reason it's not used in the scientific literature. The first problem is that it categorized personality into types. It uses four dimensions, which are dichotomized into a two by two by two by two, four dimensions, two by two by two by two, thus yielding 16 personality types. That means that in a room of 17 people, there are at least two with the exact same personality. 
Have you ever met someone with an identical personality as you? There are an infinite number of levels of traits, not just two. People are not either short or tall. We measure gradations of height in feet and inches. People are not either not smart or smart. We measure intelligence in IQ points. The other major problem with the MBTI is that it suffers from something called poor test retest reliability. If a test is reliable, then your scores on it should be very similar on any two administrations of it. With the MBTI, your scores can vary mightily from administration to administration, from day to day. Personality is a largely heritable and somewhat immutable predisposition towards similar feelings, thoughts, and behavior across situations and time. It does not change very much, even over very many years. Well, let's look at some desirable trait levels of the big five for managers. This is where the CANU acronym becomes useful. Suppose we measure traits using a one to seven scale where one is extremely low and seven is extremely high. Managers should have high conscientiousness, but not so high that it predisposes them to obsessive compulsiveness. Too much conscientiousness can cause one to focus too much on the details and not enough on the big picture. A score of six will serve managers well. They should have moderately low agreeableness. About a 2.5 is best. If they're at a level of one, nobody will like them and they will not like anyone else. If their score is seven, then they will be focused entirely on forging friendly, affiliative bonds in the workplace. And since they are so agreeable, the subordinates will see them as pushovers, so to speak. Managers should be moderately low on neuroticism, but not so low that they are completely immune to task-related anxiety. They still need to be motivated to meet deadlines, but not so highly motivated that they are neurotic and crippled by anxiety. They should be moderately low on openness. That is right about at the middle. Being closed-minded can lead to the inability to recognize opportunities. If it's too high, they're easily distracted by every new thing that crosses their desk. Managers should be moderate on extroversion. If they are complete introverts, then they despise interpersonal interaction. Management is a people-oriented endeavor, and disliking people gets in the way of managerial effectiveness. Too much extroversion, and they cannot get their job done because their need for interaction and stimulation drives them to chit-chat too much and never get things done, nor even allow others to get things done. It should be clear by now that being extreme on any of the big five can have some drawbacks. One can be too low or too high on a trait. It does not mean that a manager with different trait levels than these cannot be effective. It does mean, however, that management may not come as easy to them as it does to some people. So the C is for conscientiousness, the A for agreeableness, N for neuroticism, O for openness, and E for extroversion, canoe. The research is very, very clear that the most important personality trait for job performance in any job, no matter how you measure performance, is conscientiousness. It does not matter what that job is, how you measure it. Conscientiousness is king. Think about it. Conscientiousness entails being goal-oriented, driven, diligent, perseverant. Don't those things sound desirable to have in a manager, a waiter, police officer, professor, or any other job? Let's move on. There are many mistakes that can make a difference between being a good manager who made it all the way to the top of their company and a bad manager who may have been successful in their careers but knocked off the fast track at the middle to upper management levels. Both groups were initially very similar. 
and had enjoyed success at the lowest managerial level. The biggest difference between the two were how they managed people. Good managers were much more effective in their interpersonal skills than were bad ones. Here are some of the managerial mistakes that can short circuit one's rise up the corporate ladder. Bad managers are insensitive to others by being abrasive, intimidating, and using a bullying management style. Good managers show empathy and understanding towards subordinates, and they do not rule by the sword as bad managers do. Bad managers are cold, aloof, or arrogant in that they unnecessarily put interpersonal distance between themselves and the people that they supervise. If management is an endeavor of being human, then bad managers lack the ability to make a human connection. Bad managers tend to be more Machiavellian than others. Machiavellianism is the tendency to believe that the ends always justify the means and that it's acceptable and sometimes even desirable to crush whoever gets in one's way. If crushing one's colleagues is the only path toward success, then success is likely to be very fleeting and short-lived. Bad managers tend to be overly ambitious. They don't hide their desire for higher positions and boast proudly of their ambition to rise above their current level. This can be very off-putting for subordinates to learn that their manager really does not want to manage them. Bad managers don't let people do their own job. They micromanage and refuse to delegate duties for fear that they cannot claim the prize when an accomplishment is made by the subordinate team. They want all of the glory but none of the heartache. Bad managers simply cannot hire the right people. Bad managers tend to make intuitive hiring decisions and they fail to rely on the various tests commonly used for hiring, like resumes and interviews and work sample tests. Because intuition is fraught with error, bad managers make way too many mistakes when they hire or don't hire the right people based upon their gut feeling. Bad managers cannot see the forest for the trees. They cannot see the long-term goal, nor can they develop a long-term plan for getting there. Part of this is due to their inability to trust others, who are actually quite necessary for long-term goal accomplishment. They focus instead on the achievement of short-term goals by implementing easily managed business practices instead of effective long-term business strategies. Bad managers are not adaptable at all. They cannot change their style with subordinates, nor with their supervisor. Their inability to adapt to the changing roster of supervisors above them shows their inflexibility and unwillingness to be different in different situations. They have one mode of operating and think that that mode should be enough for every situation. Bad managers tend to be overly reliant on their mentor or on one particular advocate. They are quick to point out who their mentor is or was when faced with opposition to them and their ideas. They turn to that mentor as a one-stop shop for solutions, even though the mentor may not be a master of all situations. Nevertheless, bad managers cannot change their style because they believe that their mentor was perfect in all regards. Let's move on. Much like physicians read the medical journals because they have embraced evidence-based medicine, managers should read the management journals so that they do not have to rely on hunches or intuition or drunk Uncle Ralph's advice. Managers should practice evidence-based management. There are three main types of managerial research. First are popular press publications like the Wall Street Journal and Business Week. To understand them, a manager does not need advanced academic training. They are available to the general public at magazine stands everywhere. Practitioner journals include publications like the Harvard Business Review, known as HBR, and the Academy of Management Perspectives. 
HBR is available at bookstores like Barnes & Noble and, of course, by subscription. It helps tremendously if the reader has some business training or academic experience. Academic journals are scientific journals where hypotheses are developed from theory and tested using data collected from people or companies with advanced statistical tools like multi-level modeling, structural equation modeling, or regression-based tests for mediation. These journals make up the majority of training materials for PhD students and are the product of academics like me and others. They require serious advanced education to produce and to understand. However, all three form the foundation of the references in every chapter of a basic introduction to management textbook. Look at the reference section of your textbook. As the material gets more complicated, you will see that most of the references in the chapters are from academic journals. The sources for the foundation of evidence-based management are these, popular press, practitioner journals, and especially academic journals. The science is out there, so use it. Meta-analysis, which is a study of studies, is helping management scholars understand how well their research supports management theories. Practitioner managers can also benefit from this. Meta-analysis is a statistical technique that synthesizes the results of dozens or even hundreds of existing academic journal findings to arrive at the so-called true score correlation. One need only think for a minute or two about news articles claiming that, for example, red wine decreases your lifespan by some X number of years. Then, in a week or two, some news person reports that red wine will extend your life by Y number of years. Well, which is it? Does it decrease or increase? If the direction can be settled, then how long is the increase or the decrease? Meta-analysis answers that question by assembling all existing studies on a topic and statistically correcting for study artifacts like sample size and unreliability to arrive at the true score correlation. Good managers who want to follow the science so that they can make better decisions should consult any of a hundred different academic databases like PsycInfo or ABIInform. Enter in keywords like meta-analysis and the name of two variables like politics and commitment and see what pops up. Meta-analysis suggests that it's wise to have job applicants take a general mental ability test. Sometimes it's acceptable to use college or high school GPA as a proxy for intelligence or general mental ability, although the relationship between general mental ability and intelligence and GPA are not one to one to one. Because meta analytically, the true correlation between intelligence and performance is 0.51. So the shared variance or overlap between intelligence and performance is 0.51 squared or 26%. 26%! Intelligence is responsible for 26% of job performance. That's a big chunk of the performance domain. Additionally, we now know that the perceptions of organizational politics, which is everywhere to one degree or another, is correlated at negative 0.41 with commitment to one's job. Thus, as politics in the workplace exemplified by favoritism and a reluctance to rely on merit, as that increases, one's commitment to the job decreases a great deal. Therefore, it's wise to wipe out organizational politics in the workplace and instead rely on a meritocracy instead of political favoritism. Let's move on. Here are two pages of a published meta-analysis by yours truly. I've also included the main findings in a table on the second page of the article. It was published in the Journal of Business and Psychology after rigorous peer review and many changes to the original submission. The key statistic here is the Greek letter rho, which looks like a squiggly lowercase p. Rho is an estimation of the population-based correlation between X and Y. That is, it's an approximate correlation for all workers 
in all jobs everywhere. You can find this paper and many thousands of others in the databases called Psych Info and ABI Inform. Let's move on. Well, that's all for now. Thank you.